Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our final educational seminar of the summer, which is wild to say. Um, it does not feel like it's already almost mid-August. Um, but today's panel is on incorporating pro bono into your career, where we have attorneys share insight and practical tips from their own experience about how to make pro bono fit into a busy professional life. Um, and before we actually get to the panel, because this is our incorporating pro bono session, I wanted to briefly introduce Jessica Schneider, who's Pilly's managing attorney. And Jessica is responsible for helping expand and enhance pro bono legal assistance across Illinois for Pilly. Um, and I wanted to give her an opportunity to share a few words to you before we officially start our panel. So Jessica. Thanks, Brent, um, and good to see everyone. Um, before joining Pilly just June 1st, um, I had a background in legal aid, and we definitely had a lot of Pilly fellows um, that went on to do pro bono with the agencies I worked at, and it was really great to build that relationship. Um, Pilly has a lot of specific opportunities uh, for attorneys, as Brent mentioned, around the state, um, but another part that's really great of what Pilly does is the pro bono initiative. And that's really that we want to facilitate best practices. We wanna facilitate people sharing best practices with each other. And we wanna provide resources and programming to do that. Um, and occasionally also technical consultations. So if, if law firms or corporations are looking to develop or grow their work, um, we are a partner in that and can help that happen. And I think that's a really important part of Pilly's work, both, you know, around here in Chicago and Cook County and around the state. And so that's something that I'll be working on along with Brent. And obviously we're glad to have everyone here to share their experiences with that as well. Great, thank you, Jessica. And so that just means pay attention to your emails even after the summer for more information from Pilly about programs that we're doing, events that we're having. Um, and always feel free to, to join us. We wanna hear your voice and ideas um, and, and have you as part of the conversation. Um, so I'll pass it off to Sara Gadiri, who is Associate and Pro Bono Counsel at Chapman and Cutler, and she'll be helping to moderate today's session. So thank you. Thanks so much for that. First special shout out to Gabe. I see you on here. Gabe will be joining us um, at the firm. So I'm really excited always to see uh, uh, familiar names and faces and stuff like that. Um, before we get started, um, you know, I just want to give you guys a quick overview of, of what to expect. Um, we want this to be interactive, even though none of you have your video on, you're welcome to turn it on at any point. Um, also no pressure. Um, if you have questions for us, we want this to be interactive. Um, obviously, I have questions to propose to, or to pose rather to all the attorneys who've been, you know, gracious enough to be on this, but we want to hear from you. We want this to answer your questions too. If you have everything, you know, anything in, you know, in the back of your head that you want to ask. Um, I very much view this as like an AMA. You can ask me anything about pro bono, um, and I'm happy to answer um, any questions just like the rest of the panelists are. So the idea here is that we're going to give hopefully some insights and practical tips um, about our experiences and, and kind of help you figure out um, how to fit pro bono into your career. As much as it's great to do pro bono all the time, and some of you guys might end up in legal aid, some of you guys might not. Um, and uh, we want to want to you know try to explain how to how to make the time for the things that are important. So with that, um, what I'm going to do is sort of turn it over to each of the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, uh, I'll do, I'll introduce myself first um, and then sort of let uh, each of the panelists uh, down the line go. So um, like Brett said, um, my name is Sara Gadiri. I am pro bono counsel at Chapman and Cutler. Um, what that means is I'm in charge of running all the pro bono at the firm. Um, I manage all the cases. I help find new opportunities. Um, I do pro bono work myself. I liaise with um, all of the pro bono organizations that we work with in all of our offices in New York, Chicago, um, Charlotte, San Francisco, um, Salt Lake City. Um, so I'm throughout the, the country, um, often talking to legal aid organizations about what they need help with, how we can um, sort of fill those needs and that kind of stuff. I went to University of Iowa for law school um, uh, and uh, did a lot of pro bono work there. I worked in the legal clinic when I was in law school, which I highly recommend. Um, and uh, before being pro bono counsel at Chapman, I was in the litigation department, which I still am. Um, and uh, doing um, work representing banks and financial institutions, um, you know, in bankruptcy and in regular litigation, both in state and federal. So with that, um, 
I'll, uh, I'll give a little bit of information about how I work with Pili. So um, we, our firm volunteers a lot with Pili, um, specifically on their free Legal program. And we also send um, people like Gabe uh, to uh, work at legal aid organizations and that sort of thing. Um, you know, why I do pro bono and, and what the value is from my perspective, you know, there, this is a, a thing that we talk about, you know, every day. What's the business case for pro bono? Why do you do pro bono? Is it because it makes you feel better? Is it because you like to help people? Is it because, you know, this happened to your family and you don't want it to happen to anybody else? Um, I think all of those things are, are, are true. I do pro bono because I feel like I have a need to give back. Um, my dad came to this country in 1977 speaking absolutely no English at all. Um, he, other people helped him get to where he needed to be. Now he's a professor. Um, so I feel very much um, sort of indebted to all the people who, who helped him and why I might not be able to help those people back. I feel very much that it's about paying it forward and, and doing good and putting as much good into the world as possible, especially when you, know, you turn on the news and everything is so negative. There are things you can do. Um, you don't have to sit here and watch life happen or watch injustices happen. Um, you as an attorney are going to be able to make a difference. And so part of it is, you know, exercising your privilege and doing sort of that important work to make sure that you're not, you're leaving the world better than how you got it. So with that, um, I'll ask, uh, let's see, Sabrina first, because Sabrina and I have been friends for a very, very long time, um, to introduce yourself briefly about your current position, connection to Pili, why you do pro bono, and then the value of pro bono from your, from your perspective. Will do. So, um, I am an associate at Jackson Lewis. Um, I do labor and employment law now. Um, I started, well, I mean, I know Sarah from very, very early on because I was involved in pipeline programs and she and I were both involved in um, Legal Track, which is a really awesome program that you guys aren't eligible for anymore, but it's a really cool program. Um, but I, throughout my legal and throughout my introduction to the legal field, I sought out programs like the one that Sarah and I were involved in, and Peely was an awesome way to kind of get acclimated to the legal field through work, because I um, was a mother, even when I met Sarah, I was a mother, and so it was important for me to not only get an introduction, but also to get paid. So um, I started working with Peely as, um, after my 1L summer, I did a Peely internship um, at the Department of Health and Human Services, and um, it was an amazing experience. It was one of the few um, summer positions for law students that was available outside of DC um, in the government, in the federal government. So it was a really awesome job and I really learned a lot. And I actually also got to do some employment work, which is important to me. Um, and then I was a Peely Fellow um, and after my two, after my 3L year, um, I was a Peely Fellow at the uh, Legal Aid Foundation, LAF. And um, even before that, one of the, um, legal aid agencies that I interacted with. I didn't end up going to work there for my 1L summer, but I was able to do a clinic with them during law school um, because of the connection that I made through Peely. So I've, so throughout my law school career and before becoming a lawyer, Peely was really like a really um, huge part of getting me access to the legal community here in Chicago and getting me access to jobs, which was really important. <laughs> um, I ultimately went to a firm because as I said, I have children. I had two children by the time I graduated. So it was important to me to be able to like have a really steady found financial foundation. Um, and not saying you can't otherwise, but that was kind of where my journey took me, particularly in employment law. And um, so I've been, I've bounced around from, um, in, from different firms. I was at Winston & Strawn, um, PLA, and now I'm at Jackson Lewis. Unfortunately, because firm life was crazy, my connections with Peely um, were kind of at the, uh, I was always at the luncheons, I was always a supporter, but I was not actively engaged in Peely um, early in my legal career, but um, I was fortunate to be sought out for the um, Young Professionals Board. I was the uh, chair of the uh, Young Professionals Board last, or I guess two years ago, now that Steve stepped down, um, or now that Steve's passed on the baton. But, um, and now I am still on the Young Professionals Board as just a member, and I was social chair last year, the best social chair they've ever had, also the first. But um, I am now, <laughs> I am now just a member, I think, um, which is good because I'm getting swamped at work. And uh, I really love Peely. I think it's an awesome organization. And like Brent said, don't ignore the emails after you leave. And even if you've ignored them for a long time, don't feel like you can't 
make a like reconnect with them even though I wasn't involved in Peely in my early legal career, I was really involved in pro bono. It's really important to, for, it was important for me to be involved with pro bono really early on because I am public interest minded and you kind of need to set yourself apart from other associates early in your career and pro bono is the way to do it. You get really great experience. Um, you learn a lot. People throw you into the fire because a lot of partners kind of don't want to be bothered with some things. And so they'll let the associates get their feet wet doing things that are lower stakes for the firm. Um, so that's me. I'm also pro bono coordinator or co-pro bono coordinator now at Jackson Lewis, partly um, because of my connections with Peely and because of my commitment that I've shown in the past to pro bono and really, um, the pro bono coordinator position where I am now is very different than what it would look like at other firms because our pro bono program isn't that robust. So um, I do rely on Peely and its resources to kind of get me access to different things like free legal answers and things like that because I don't, I don't like because the things aren't already embedded in the firm as they are in some of the larger firms like Winston and DLA. Um, so that's me. Great. Um, so the next on my in my little squares is Steve. So Steve, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, I'm Steve Trubeck. Uh, I'm a, I will say, mid-level associate at uh, Brian K. Flayton Paisner downtown. Um, been there since, I think I summered in 2013, so it seems like forever. Um, uh, I work, I would say, primarily in uh, intellectual property. So mostly soft IP, so um, trademark litigation, trademark prosecution before the United States Patent and Trademark Office, uh, copyright litigation, things of that nature, um, the occasional patent litigation where I don't understand anything. Um, my connection to Pili actually didn't come until about three years ago uh, when Pili was putting together for the first time a young professionals board. Uh, the pro bono coordinator in our office is actually really good friends, excuse me, with Mike, uh, Mike Bergman from Pilly. They uh, used to work together at CVLS. Uh, and so I was introduced to uh, Michael and Sang um, and was fortunate enough to, to, to join the inaugural um, Young Professionals Board uh, in late 2017 uh, and am just wrapping up my very interesting year, just given what's going on in the world, um, as, as chair of the Young Professionals Board. Um, I, I would say that for, for me, I do, um, I do pro bono work for several reasons. Um, first of all, I enjoy it. I, I try to take on pro bono work in areas that I'm interested in or, or areas where it's, it's a cause that I'm actually uh, very passionate about or interested in. Um, it's, it's, you know, one thing to, um, no disrespect to banks, but it's no, it's one thing to, to, you know, be looking at a screen and, and representing corporations, um, all day. Um, but, you know, when you actually get to, to put your legal expertise to use for, um, organizations that you really care about or causes that you really care about, and then get to see tangible results and, and also get to see the firsthand, um, the, the just appreciation of, the uh, the clients that you are working for who otherwise would not really be able to uh, afford the type of legal representation that that we're providing um, it's 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 really quite amazing um, so that's I mean that that sort of in a nutshell is um, is why I do pro bono um, and yeah great thanks Steve last but not least Go ahead, Neha. Hi, good morning, or I guess good afternoon. Uh, my name is Neha Tannen. I'm an associate attorney at Ford & Britain, which is a small, uh, very small uh, boutique litigation firm. We do primarily uh, insurance defense litigation. I primarily practice in construction cases, meaning I represent smaller subcontractors and the occasional general contractor on a project after an accident occurred. Um, I worked at a mid-sized law firm prior to my current position where um, there wasn't really a pro bono coordinator at both of my jobs, which I think is in vast contrast to um, the other two panelists. But um, I've always found a, a way in which to get uh, 
a way in which to have my bosses or superiors understand the value of pro bono for me and the reasons why I do it. Um, I have been to a lot of the Peely fundraisers and like the trivia nights and stuff um, because of Brent. Um, he's a, a friend of a friend and now one of my friends. So um, I really appreciate the work that they do. I think it's very valuable. I actually primarily volunteer I do pro bono work at a CVLS clinic, which is Chicago Volunteer Legal Services Clinic, um, one Saturday a month on Devon Street, which is uh, what you could informally call Little India and Little Pakistan. Um, and so we see a lot of clients there and from all sorts of things, divorce cases, custody cases, immigration issues, social security benefits, um, I actually took on a pro bono case myself on a custody case of two kids with a single mom. Uh, recently, I'm still in, involved in that. I thought it would be quick, but it is not quick. That's okay. Um, I'm learning a lot, especially because it's not my area of expertise. So one of the big reasons that I, and I think value of pro bono is you get to practice in areas in which you never practiced before. I've never touched a divorce case. I've never touched a custody case before. Um, but at, at a certain point, you kind of have to just dip your feet in and see where it goes. And um, I think that that's a really valuable experience. I think also with the clinic, um, I really learned the, the essential need of access to justice in a lot of people. I think the language barrier is very large, especially in Chicago, where there's a lot of languages spoken, Polish, Spanish, um, Hindi for Indian people or Urdu for uh, Pakistani people. And uh, they just don't, uh, a lot of people just don't know how to even start a case, let alone answer a complaint or get them, uh, you know, file an appearance. So it's just very little things. And I agree with what Steve said is there's so much appreciation, even with the simplest of tasks, like explaining how to fill out a form, um, a petition for dissolution of marriage, for example, in the language that they understand that I don't think you get in your day-to-day -day life when you're talking with your clients um, or what you're doing. So um, I don't know, at a very young age, I thought I, my parents always made us volunteer, which is very valuable, and I think that was great. So that's one of the reasons why I've continued to do so for my own fulfillment and uh, I think skill development also. Awesome. So now we're going to start into the, the actual questions here. And obviously, like I said, if there are other questions that come up uh, that you have, um, throw them in the chat box. I'll keep an eye on them as we, as we go forward here too. Um, so let's talk really about the work first. Um, uh, what was the first pro bono case you guys took on and do you see, what types of things do you see um, young associates like right out of, uh, out of law school and just like in their first sort of years at the firm um, take on? Uh, Steve, do you want to give it a shot for the first one? Yeah, sure. Um, so I actually remember my first pro bono project very well. Um, it was probably within a few months of me starting at the firm. Um, I what I wanted to go into intellectual property, um, but I didn't really know anything really about trademarks or copyrights other than, you know, what I learned in law school. Um, and so one of our uh, senior associates in the, our St. Louis office uh, was working with a friend who wanted to apply for a uh, registration for a mark um, that was associated with um, charitable fundraising for children with cancer. Um, basically what, what had happened was when she was in elementary school, I think um, one of, one of um, her classmates uh, very unfortunately um, was diagnosed with cancer um, and was very embarrassed about having to go to school without any hair. Um, and so what all the kids did was they, they all wore hats. Um, sort of like as a, a sign of, you know, sign of uh, solidarity with, with him. Um, I, I think he, you know, very unfortunately wound up passing away. Um, and for, for whatever reason, 15, 20 years later, um, this woman decided, hey, what about reviving this as an actual program where, you know, we raise money for other schools that have children in a similar situation um, to, to, you know, all wear, wear hats um, and, you know, also raise money for kids who have cancer. Um, so this, this was, this was not an organization. I mean, I guess it was, but it was, it was a one woman organization, uh, when we first got involved. Um, and I, uh, it was a very good skill building exercise for me because, um, it, it was, 
as it turns out, a relatively simple application to put together. Um, and so it both helped me uh, extremely to, to really get my, my footing on uh, what type of work I would be doing, but also helped her uh, because she was able to actually, um, I mean, I think, I think when we got the application on file, actually she was just ecstatic and, and now she has a registration. Um, and so that, that was very meaningful to me. Um, it's one of the reasons why I still remember it six years later or five years later, rather. Um, but yeah, so that was, that was my, my first pro bono project. And I'm sorry, what did you, what was the other part of the question? I'm sorry. What, what do you see young associates at your firm doing? What are the sort of the, the, the baby steps, first pro bono opportunities that you see most common? Yeah, so I think part of it, uh, I mean, I, I work at a larger law firm. So we've got maybe 50 attorneys in the Chicago office, but we've got uh, offices all over the country, in Europe, um, et cetera. So one of the really nice things about that is that the pro bono work that I do um, is not limited to clients who are actually in Chicago or matters that are actually in Chicago. Um, so a, a lot of times what will happen is we will get projects that come in from other offices and um, the, the pro bono coordinator at our office will actually ask pretty much all the associates whether they'd be interested in taking on a project like this. Um, a lot of times I see younger associates saying yes very happily um, to these projects. It's, it's great experience for them, um, helps build their hours too, when they may not otherwise be that busy as a, as a young associate. Um, they get to, you know, th this, is, this is not generally a situation where a partner comes into you and says, hey, you're working on this matter and you're like, oh, cool. Um, but you actually get to have some say in, in what type of pro bono, uh, pro bono matters you would like to do. Um, for, for me, I think as a young associate, I, I started out doing a lot of trademark pro bono matters, but that's, that's really just because that was the area that I was interested in. Um, and again, it didn't matter where any of the clients were. I, I could draft a trademark application for someone who was in California or, you know, Canada, didn't matter. Um, we actually have uh, a number of pro bono clients that will occasionally ask us to do work for them. And that's, that I think um, sometimes winds up being more general research-based, um, updating, uh, you know, 50 state surveys, things of that nature, um, looking at novel uh, court decisions and, and how they've been interpreted recently. Um, and so I, I generally see younger associates taking on projects like that. Um, we, I just finished like the third stage of a project for a, a client in, um, in California, which um, where we were doing research on certain gun related laws. Um, and so uh, a number of the younger associates, uh, not just in our office, but in other offices as well, as well uh, took on that project um, and so there was a team of us and we all had, you know, different things to do. Um, and younger associates wound up doing most of the research and the writing. And then, you know, me as a more senior person um, would, would do a review. So that's, that's sort of in, in my specific job um, and, and job environment. That's, that's how I see younger associates getting involved at the early stages. Awesome. Um, Neha, do you want to add anything? Um, what was your first uh, pro bono opportunity? And, and I know you mentioned you don't have a coordinator or something at your office, but do you see other junior associates in, in your small office doing um, pro bono work too? Yeah, so uh, my first one was a 1983 case actually um, against uh, one of the smaller suburban police departments in Cook County. Um, There's an allegation of uh, police uh, misconduct essentially and an arrest without having read the Miranda rights and uh, I believe in, there was an argument that I made about an unconstitutional seizure of his cell phone. Don't quote me on it, it's been like 10 years. Um, so it, a lot of stuff that I've never practiced before. Uh, I don't remember how it came through our office. This was at my old firm. 
Uh, I do see younger associates asking for it. My experience has always been, if I heard about it, I would, I, I would volunteer to take it on. Um, the one thing I will say that I think a lot of young associates might shy away from is asking your superiors, even if they're not on that pro bono matter, to take a look at something. Um, I've always had the pleasure of wonderful bosses, and that might just be my luck. But um, I, especially with that 1983 case, uh, I wasn't at that time very familiar with federal court either. Um, so I remember walking into the partner I was working for at that time and just talking to him a little bit about the procedures and if he could look over a couple of things. And he always would. And I think primarily as an associate, especially a younger one, is if you do the bulk of the work and you want someone to review it, I highly doubt someone's going to, you know, show you the door and say, no way, no how. Um, if you put in the legwork and the grunt work, someone, there's almost always someone who will be willing and able to help with you or help you out on that. Um, in my current firm, there's only seven of us. So I, we, a lot of us just kind of do our own thing. So I'm not really sure about how, if other people are doing it or if, and how they're getting cases I generally the ones I've done have been because I sought them out so I, I try to have at least one kind of ongoing at all times because it, it makes me uh, cute and hone my skills and feel better I guess about life awesome uh, Sabrina your first case and um, what do you see being done by uh, younger associates at Jackson Lewis yeah so my first case um, it was an asylum case with I forget the name, National Immigrant Justice Center, NIJC, something like that. Right. Um, and I sought that case out. I was a summer associate. I sought that case out because as a summer, there wasn't a ton. Winston and Strawn is a general uh, services firm. So they have litigation, corporate, everything, but a very small employment group. There wasn't a ton of employment work for summers. So I reached out to the pro bono coordinator and said, hey, what are the employment partners working on? assigned me to a case with an employment partner. So one of the employment partners had been work had been working on this like ongoing asylum case with someone from Ethiopia and she'd been working she she was like invested in it. It was like her baby, but the some but the associate had just left who was working on it with her and so she was looking for help and she and I were actually able to develop a really great relationship over this case because I mean if you guys do asylum cases, you'll know there's no way to not get emotionally invested in one. Um, it was just so heart wrenching, and like we cried with this guy, and like so it was it was just natural for us to find a form a bond through this case. Um, and I thought that that was really great because now I, even though I hadn't done a ton of employment work, I had really made it clear that my interests were in employment going into my going through my summer, and I had also made a really good relationship with um, an employment partner. Um, so that was my first case. Other cases, when you have a pro bono coordinator, I think the pro bono coordinator is really intentional about getting young associates on matters. It doesn't matter what it is. After I got to the firm, I was staffed on this huge divorce pro bono case. It was the worst, but it was like, it was a great way to get um, hours, to get experience and things like that. I don't, I wouldn't say that my like public interest um, itch was scratched by that case, but it was still like, really good um, experience. But I mean, there's also like the SAP program. That's one thing that I'm trying to um, incorporate more into Jackson Lewis for the younger associates. Like um, uh, Neha, I'm, our firm is not, um, that is a lot, like a lot of people just do their own thing. People that are interested do it, but if you're not, you just don't. So we're trying to incorporate things where, in, where we can get people limited engagements that are going to be really meaningful to them so that they can get in and get out because we really need them. We really need people like, unlike the other firms I was at, there's not a dearth of work at Jackson Lewis. All associates are going to be overworked <laughs> for the most part. Like their former, former slogan was like, all we do is work. So there's not a situation where, um, and where associates are just sitting around looking for work. So it's more about, getting them the experience and getting and having people have a constant connection to some pro bono even if it, if it can't be a huge case funny thing if you um are, if you're on the um bar in the southern district of illinois regardless if you're an associate or not there is no trial bar so you can be appointed to cases i didn't know that all of the associates in our firm were told that they should be 
that they should be, um, you know, on the bar in the Southern District. Apparently, none of the other associates listened except for me, and I was appointed to a case last year, which was, you know, interesting. Didn't see that coming, but um, that's another thing I think that um, younger associates end up doing at our firm is some of these appointment cases either appointed themselves or they take on the bulk of the work from whatever partner was appointed. Um, so some of the prisoners' rights cases, things like that. Unfortunately. At, at my prior firm, even though I was doing labor and employment, a lot of the work that I did in pro bono was labor and employment, but at Jackson Lewis, they take the mindset that anytime we represent an employee against an employer, we put ourselves at risk of future cases. Yeah. yeah, we put ourselves at risk of not being able to get future cases um, with that employer. So we don't do employment pro bono. So it's not, so it's a little bit harder for us to get people interested because really you're just honing in on a skill set and not a substantive area. Um, but like, so like I said, we're really focused on like kind of those limited engagements where people can get in, get in, get really good experience that is going to be easily translatable to the work that they do and then get out. And that um, appointment case that I was in, I actually, um, I was, I, I actually got to examine my first witnesses in, um, in an evidentiary hearing. I got to, you know, prepare motions for summary judgment from, you know, and I mean, I had done motions for summary judgment before, but the hearing stuff is like important, especially if you want to be on the trial bar, because you need to, you know, check those boxes. Um, and so I got, I got really great experience doing that, even though it was not, it, it's not even a pro bono thing that I would personally have picked, but it was really interesting. The guy that I have, that I represent, he needs representation. I, I mean, there's a whole slew of other issues, but he needs representation and he has a good case. He was wrong. So I feel good about it, but, it, and I got good work out of it. So the, I think we're trying to push things like that where people can get in, get really good experience that they can market to the partners as, okay, now I've done this market to the clients to say, cause now that I'm about to possibly go to trial this year, I can say, oh, I've done, you know, these four evidentiary hearings and one of them was this pro bono case. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, what I see a lot of our newer associates doing and what I really pitch to our newer associates, you know, as pro bono counsel is like what Sabrina was saying is limited engagement things. So a lot of clinics, um, one of the things that you guys might have seen, um, and maybe not because of coronavirus, there's not as many clinics going on as there used to be. Um, but they're limited scope. You essentially, you know, take, you know, your afternoon and do a DACA petition for somebody or, um, you know, you sit down and do an expungement or, or ceiling petition or whatever happens to be. Um, so those like, you know, pop in, pop out are really, really nice opportunities. And they're also really good for getting people's feet wet. Um, and, and another opportunity I feel is really good for getting people's feet wet is free legal, free legal answers. So I monitor all of our first years because we don't have that many. So I can keep an eye on all of them. They all have to send me their responses first so I can check them and make sure they're not getting, giving bad advice to people. Um, but it's a really good way to build substantive experience. Um, and so what I, what I tend to think about is, okay, well, if you don't know what you want to do, you know, go into free legal answers. There's topics all over the place. You can answer a question about divorce and then you can turn around and ask, answer a question about unemployment or turn around and answer a question about immigration or whatever it happens to be. So it gives you a really opportunity to sort of start building that substantive stuff. Because so what I find with young associates is often they're like, well, I don't know what I'm doing and I don't know how to do anything. So like, I don't want to do this pro bono work because I don't want to mess up or I don't know, know what I'm doing and I, I just, I don't feel comfortable. Um, because at my firm, we're a firm of like very special, so we're focused on finance. So like we're really good at the stuff we do and we don't do a lot of stuff. We're not a general services firm. So somebody's saying, okay, well, my comfort zone is, you know, this little place, um, you know, how do you build, uh, you know, expertise outside of that? Um, and one of the things I think is really helpful for that is free Google answers, which kind of leads me to my second question, which is, how do you build that expertise? You know, you all have mentioned, you, you know, except for Steve, who took pro bono cases that are actually related to his practice group, um, but, I'm, but I'm sure that's not the only stuff you do. Um, how, do you, how do you feel comfortable, you know, as an employment lawyer taking a prisoner rights case that you don't know anything about? Um, Serena, since you just mentioned uh, that, why don't you go ahead and start with this one? Well, I think the first thing is you don't. Um, I like I never. I don't think I ever walk in and and feel comfortable necessarily. And I think that that's because I care, and I think that that's okay. Like, I, and because I don't feel comfortable, I just research, research, research. I'm probably like overly like. Uh, I'm, I'm overboard on the research. Um, I, there is when you get appointed to prisoners' rights cases in Illinois, and I think it's regardless if you're in the Southern, Central, or 
Northern District, there's this guy, John Chapman, who's just like amazing. And like, he helps everybody and he knows everything. And I bug him. I'm always on the phone with him. And I don't care if he's sick of it because he's just going to have to deal because my client needs him to be there for me. And that's his job. Yeah, that's his job. And, and he's good at it. And he's really helpful. He's never like been annoyed with me or anything. But if he is, oh, well. <laughs> um, but he's awesome. And and I think, like I said, I never necessarily, I all like, Every time I come up with a legal theory, I run it by him just to make sure that I'm not being crazy and I'm not, um, you know, applying something that makes sense for employment law but doesn't make sense for this area of law to, you know, to his case. Um, and so with, with that, like I said, there's John Chapman. And then um, with some of the other pro bono I do, like when we do free, free legal answers, I know when I work with Brent, like I always ask him questions when we were in the clinics together. Like I have no problem saying, I don't get this, please tell me if this makes sense. Or, and like I said, research, so you go to, um, uh, what is, I forget the name of it, legal. Um, Illinois Legal, legal Aid Online, Online. Yeah. yes. So um, we go to that and we research on there. And then with other things, um, like I said, it's just been research. Like even after I asked John a question, I'll still go on LexisNexis and do some research just to make sure that other things that I'm seeing are, in, you know, are the same as what I see. So I think there's just like, when you walk into the situation, there's just a little bit more, you know, work you have to do beforehand. That's one of the great things about doing pro bono through agencies because they have the subject matter experts in there. So when we were doing the asylum case, you know, both of us would cry and then we would walk out and be like, we can't help him. He needs more than us. We are not worthy. And then they would like, you know, give us a pep talk and put us in the right place to like get the resources that we needed for him and um, help him appropriately. So I think you just, I think the first step is admitting that you don't have all the answers, admitting that the things that make sense for you and your clients in your area of expertise may not make sense for these pro bono clients. And then once you realize that and care enough, you'll do the right amount of research. And eventually like with the law, there's never like a true ending point. We have to figure that out for ourselves and balance our work appropriately. But if you care enough, you can be confident that you're at least making the best decision and, and like, you know, and doing enough to get to that best decision. I saw a lot of head nodding from you, Neha. Oh, 100%. I, I never feel comfortable. I don't think I ever will. Um, those divorce cases, uh, the Social Security, uh, whatever else we see, immigration. Um, one of the biggest things that I don't think people really think about, and Sabrina kind of touched on it, was it, utilize your network. You don't realize how many different lawyers you know. Just from my law school group class, my friends, I, you know, like I know someone who does real estate. I know someone who does immigration. Just shoot them an email, shoot them a text, go on LinkedIn, ask them a question. You would be so surprised at how quickly and how helpful these people will be because you're asking them one particular question on a certain subject matter. Um, the, the custody case, for example, I know a lot of people um, that do family law, for example, and you know, even a question like, oh, I got to sign this judge. Is there anything I should know? I got a response in five minutes, you know? So your network is there to help you and they will help you. For sure. I use Illinois Legal Aid Online way too much, I think, probably. I, that thing is like my lifeline. It's amazing. The other thing that really helps are like a lot of the courts now, like I think IllinoisCourts.gov even, they have fillable forms on everything. Um, like the fee waivers that a lot of times we do for our clients when they're filing an action, those are online. And they're pretty simple. They ask every single question that you need to ask these, your pro bono client. Like, about their assets and whatever else. So uh, if, and exactly what you said, if you have the desire and you don't feel comfortable, you'll make a way, you'll find a way, you'll do the research, you'll find something, you can Google it, you can use Westlaw, you can use Illinois Legal Online, you can call Brent, you know, like anyone, anyone you know will be willing to help you and don't be ashamed to ask for help. As soon as you say, hey, I got a quick question, I really, i never in my career, which of course has been short so far, you know, a couple years here, um, since 2012, no one's ever showed me the door. No one's ever, never said, I can't help you. You might get a, I'm not really sure. And at that point you do more research and that's fine. But at least you have some starting out point where someone will be like, Hey, maybe look into this. Um, so the network's really important. And obviously all the online resources are really, really, uh, really, really helpful. And then one last thing I'll say is, 
Um, I, not always will the judges be aware that you're a pro bono attorney. Sometimes they will, I think, based on your signature block on like pleadings or whatever. Um, there was that 1983 case, for example, the judge became aware that I was a pro bono attorney. She might have just seen, you know, deer in the headlights face, probably that. Um, and they, they understand that you are actually taking time out of your life and practice to do this. Um, and I think that they, I'm not saying they will, but they might, you know, cut you a little slack on some things. I remember when I was first getting that, that file in the case, I was having a little trouble contacting my client. I just told the judge, she said, okay, I'll give you an extra 14 days. Don't worry about it. So, um, just, it, it, there's a lot of ways in which you can get, um, help with these pro bono cases in various different avenues. And I think it's just yours to explore really. I have admitted in every single pro bono case where I didn't know what I was doing to the judge. I was like, look, I don't know what I'm doing. I have said literally those words to the judge. Like, I don't exactly know what I'm doing. I, you know, I'm doing this case pro bono. If you have any tips or hints or anything like that for me. And I have every judge that I have been in front of that says, thank you for your service. You know, here's how I like to do things. And has just, you know, I think it's always good to just admit and say, like, don't, don't BS a judge. They can tell. Um, so I think it's a really, really good point, Neha. Steve, anything to add? Yeah. Um, so I also had uh, a 1983 case as, as one of my first cases. Um, that one, uh, I didn't really actually realize that I was going to be working on it. Um, we got an email from the partner who had been uh, appointed asking if anyone had, you know, five or so hours to do some initial research on this matter. I said, yeah, sure. Um, and that sort of turned into me just taking over the entire case, which was cool. But, you know, I, I just didn't realize that going in. So it was a little scary. Um, and I... I had remembered that when I was actually a paralegal at my old law firm a bazillion years ago, um, one of the two partners at that firm has all, had also been appointed to a 1983 case. And I had helped out on that. And I remembered that there was, uh, I, think, I, I don't know the exact name, but it was, it was like a, a handbook that is on the Northern District of Illinois website, um, specifically devoted to 1983 cases. Um, and so I, I went on the website, found an updated version, and I mean, that thing is gold. It's, it's amazing. Um, you know, you, you, you go from saying, this is really nerve wracking. I don't know what I'm doing. What, what are all these issues? Um, but if you have some sort of treatise or book or whatever that actually goes through all these issues, it is, um, it's a godsend. Um, and I, you know, I went from having absolutely no idea how to, uh, respond to this motion to dismiss that the, the defendants had filed to saying, wait a second, according to this, there was like a Seventh Circuit case that came out, you know, last year that says that um, this issue isn't jurisdictional, you know, it's an affirmative defense, so they can't move to dismiss it based on lack of jurisdiction. Um, and so we, we wound up winning that motion. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think I would just also reiterate again what Neha and Sabrina said, utilize your network. Um, even if, you know, for, for this particular matter, I was working with a partner on it. Um, I don't think I actually really talked to him that much about the case. Uh, I, I talked to a bunch of other attorneys um, in my office as well as outside my office that either themselves had worked on 1983 cases before or uh, had more experience in, in a, a specific area. Maybe it was discovery responses with like certain objections. I just used everybody as a sounding board, um, asked how their cases had gone, what issues they had uh, run into, what, what strategies seemed to work, what didn't. Um, you know, if, if I was drafting something and um, I wasn't exactly sure, you know, maybe there was like an issue I was missing or something that I wasn't thinking of, I asked uh, a colleague um, if they wouldn't mind looking it over. 99% of the time, more than happy to, to do that. Um, so I, I think one of the most important things is, you know, A, don't reinvent the wheel because of, for a lot of this stuff, there's, there's so many resources out there. Um, treatises happen to be my favorite, but, you know, um, and also always, always, always reach out to other people and other attorneys and, and get their thoughts. Um, I mean, that's, that's really just a, a general, uh, tip, I think, for practicing it as an attorney, but, but also definitely in pro bono, maybe when you're not as, when you're working outside of your general practice area uh, and, and you want to get some additional advice from some other people. 
That's great. Yeah. You're never alone when you're doing a pro bono case, whether that's, you know, you're reaching out to somebody else in your firm, outside of your firm, at the legal aid agency that you're working with. Um, I think it's really a, an important thing to keep in mind. Um, always ask for help. Everybody wants to help. That's the great thing about the pro bono community is every single person wants, um, wants you to be successful and wants to help you, whether that's another attorney or, or you know, anybody else who's ever worked on the case. Um, we've got about 15 minutes, a little short, shy of 15 minutes here. Um, so I want to pose one last question and then give give some time for questions as well. Um, you know, we've we've given a little bit of advice here and there in our other answers, um, but what would you have wanted to hear as a starting associate about incorporating pro bono into your career? Um, and Neha, since we haven't started with you yet, go ahead. Um, I, so my uh, experience is different than Steve and Sabrina's because I don't work at a larger firm, but um, as a young associate, I think like what you said, those smaller clinics um, or smaller engagements are really, really valuable. Um, I started going to the South Asian American Bar Association Clinic on Devon uh, as a law student, actually. And at that point, because you weren't, we weren't licensed, we would just do the intake forms. And then we'd sit through the, the whole uh, matter with an attorney and see what advice they got. So um, it you're a young lawyer, you don't primarily, you you might not be as good at issue spotting or anything like that. You don't know what forms to use, that kind of stuff. That was really invaluable. You actually get to sit and watch and observe. Even if you're a young lawyer, you could do that. If you don't feel comfortable, just tell them you don't feel comfortable. They're always gonna listen, I promise. Um, just the way in watching different attorneys do what they were doing, I think was really invaluable. So if you're starting off your career, I would highly, highly recommend doing one of these clinics on the side. Um, and you can do ours. <laughs> I'll get Brett the information. If any of you want to join ours, we are doing ours by Zoom, which is pretty cool. We transitioned to Zoom. Um, so that's really great. We just had ours last Saturday. But um, yeah, it's really on your shoulders. I don't think anyone's ever really going to hand you pro bono work. I, unlike um, Steve, I know for sure, maybe Sabrina, we don't get credit for our pro bono hours. It's just you do what you want to do on the side. Make sure you still do your own hours. Um, but my superiors are aware that I'm doing it and they never, never have any qualms with it. Um, obviously I think it's, if my hours were suffering, they might have something to say about it. But even then, um, you know what you're doing and you've taken on this uh, thing to do. So, um, it, it's valuable. It is. I promise you learn so much in different practice areas and then you incorporate that into what you're doing, um, that it's, it, it's really helpful and that's what. Those are the suggestions really for young associates. That's great advice. Um, Steve, what about you? What would you have wanted to hear about incorporating it into your career? Um, so I think it, as it relates, it, so if you're in a position where you have a potential pro bono client that you want to uh, either bring into the firm or, or do work with uh, as an attorney at that firm, uh, as opposed to you know where, where matters already existing and, and you're just helping out, um, I, I think it's very, very, very t important to remember that pro bono clients are clients. Um, you know, just just because they're not paying your firm for their services doesn't mean that you don't have the same exact obligations to them as uh, as a firm that's you know paying whatever hourly fee the the firm charges. Um, so, if you are going to take on a pro bono matter make sure that you actually have the bandwidth to do it. You know, it's, it's not something that you can just blow off and say, oh, well, you know, uh, I, I wanted to do this, but you know, hey, it's just a pro bono matter. That's, you know, that's, that's not how it works. Um, the other thing that uh, I think can get people into trouble sometimes, uh, sort of going along with that, is forgetting to actually run through the matter with your firm, specifically with conflicts before doing any work on it. Um, I, I know of some attorneys who either would do pro bono work on the side without telling the firm, um, or would do it without actually running through conflicts. Um, and, and that can create very problems that are, that are, that are maybe a little difficult to solve. Um, so, I mean, you know, if you want to take on a matter, that's that's awesome. Just make sure you go through all the proper channels, um, same as you would with any other client that you would represent, right? Um, 
So that's, I think those are the, the, the two main things that I would say. That's also great advice. Um, you know, we think about treating everybody, every client is the same, right? That means you, you pay attention to your pro bono client the same way that you um, pay attention to your paying client, but all the other stuff goes along with it too. I think mean, it's a really good point. Uh, Sabrina, anything to add? Sure. I think the first thing I would say is just do it. Like I, um, I got a lot of great pro bono opportunities. And I think that this is something that I lived by when I was um, starting off is that if it was offered to me, if it looked like a good opportunity, just do it. Um, and like, and if I had time, obviously like Steve said, don't accept anything if you don't have time. And then, and, and I often was like overworked because I was squeezing in time to do certain things, but I always got like every single pro bono experience that I took, I got really great experience from. So regardless if it was something as minor as reviewing a handbook for a nonprofit agency or something as major as the divorce case that I took and had to take depositions so on like regardless of where I was and what I was doing, I learned something from every single case between from, you know, actual substantive skills to client relations to all like all across the board. Um, and I would agree with Steve that you absolutely should treat them like clients. And that's kind of my second piece that maintain your relationships, like maybe not necessarily with every individual client, because that's a little weird. But if you're working with an agency, or if you're working with a company or working with a nonprofit, and you re reviewed their handbook 10 years ago, treat them like you would any other client. If you would send any other client a bulletin about some new thing that happened with COVID, send it to them too. If you were gonna, you know, um, if you're gonna reach out to clients and send them a card, send them one too. treat your um your agency clients or corporate cl or i don't know like nonprofits or whatever like you would any other client that you work with maintain those relationships maintain them as part of your network i did not do that i treated each and every pro bono activity like i treated my client act like my other activities this is someone else's client this is someone else's once i do once i'm done with my project that's not my problem kind of a thing um and i think it would have just you know i would have been able to be more intentional in the long term now that i don't have those same connections about uh like with the pro bono coordinator now that I am the pro bono coordinator, had I maintained those relationships, I would be able to use them a little bit better and be more strategic about how I'm bringing pro bono into my firm. And also just like generally, you don't know how people in the legal community are gonna move around. Jessica, I've seen her face kind of everywhere since I start, before I became a lawyer. Sara, I recognize her face since before I became a lawyer. All like So all of these people, you have no idea how your paths are gonna cross, cross in the future. So don't like, shortchange the experience and just like get what you want out of it and move on but also think about how you can add value to the agency or to the organization that you're working for and then um, maintaining those relationships just as part of your overall network i think that's great advice too um i'll, I'll add my last piece here um and then we'll open it up for for questions because we got about five minutes left um remember to take care of yourself uh, a lot of these pro bono cases are very heavy. Um, I do a lot of asylum work. I do a lot of uh, representation of people who um, or survivors of domestic violence. Um, it's a lot of stuff that's really heavy. Um, and it's work that needs to be done because if you don't, don't do it, who will? Um, and so I feel very strongly about doing that kind of stuff. But a lot of what comes with it is um, what people call vicarious trauma. And everybody's dealt with stuff in their life. Um, and sometimes the stories that you have to hear are horrible. They're the most horrible things that you could ever imagine anybody ever doing to another human being. Um, and, you know, part of staying healthy and part of being able to continue to do this work is to make sure you don't get burned out. Um, and to remember that everybody is human. And just because you've heard 40 stories of people being, you know, tortured and raped and all these other things doesn't mean that this person's story is not individually and unique and important to listen to um, and all that stuff. But also, you know, it's important to, to take care of yourself too. And recognize, like, if you're, if something is getting to be too much for you, ask for help. Tell somebody. Um, there are some great trainings on vicarious trauma and stuff like that. Um, and some people start thinking like, oh, but pro bono is supposed to make me feel good. Pro bono is supposed to make me feel happy. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it makes you feel sad and it makes you cry. Um, and those things are good because it reminds you of what it's like to be a human. Um, I think when we represent corporate clients, you know, my clients are mostly banks, financial institutions, hedge funds. Like, I don't cry about my clients. Like, they're fine, right? If something bad happens, like, I'm not going to cry about it. Um, and you can kind of get a little hard-hearted um, doing that kind of work and saying, oh, well, it's just a million dollars. Who cares? It's just a million dollars, right? Um, and I think, you know, when you're on these deals that are multi-million dollar deals or you're in litigation where, 
you know, you're talking about somebody's, you know, you know, business or whatever, can, it can be easy to, to sort of like write it off and be like, okay, well, whatever. Like, you know, it's obviously it's important. It's my client and I care, but I don't care that same amount. Um, I think doing, you know, the asylum work or representing survivors of domestic violence or whatever happens to be um, sort of reminds you that, yeah, you are human and it's important to help other humans um, and, and remind you of what that humanity looks like um, so that you can sort of put that good back into the world, like I was saying before. So we've got three Mara, minutes. I'm sorry, can I just add one thing? Yeah, please. Um, also, just kind of along those lines, people that don't necessarily look like the perfect pro bono client need help too. So like part of what I was saying about um, like my prisoner case, it's not the case that I would have taken. He's a murderer. And like, I have to like accept that and be okay with that every day. And, and like every day I help him, I have to be okay with that. But I don't have to accept what he did. I just have to accept that despite the fact that he's a murderer, he deserves to be treated like a human while he's in prison. So like every pro bono client is not going to be, you know, the single mother of four that's properly educated and treats her kids perfectly. She's but like every person, it's like that doesn't mean that they don't need help just because they're not like, you know, this sweet individual. Like some of the asylum folks have done things that are not necessarily great things to get out of their situation. And like, you know, there's, there are things that you're going to hear, but you have to like reconcile that with the, with the fact that like the people that don't necessarily, that aren't wanting to be your first guest for who you'd help still need help and they still are entitled to their rights under the law. Right. You're not here to judge your clients. You're here to help them. I think it's a really, really good point. Um, so I got one question here in the box. Um, this might be best for Neha. Um, how have you been able to continue completing meaningful, impactful work at your firm if um, there aren't, if you don't get credit for doing the, the pro bono work or there's not a lot of other associates who are doing it? You kind of touched on it before, but. Yeah, so I, I do a lot of the stuff on the weekends, which is helpful. I do have that one case that's going on right now. Um, essentially what I end up doing, and I don't know if this is more of a timing question or, uh, or how do you get credit for it question, but timing wise, I tend to do it over my lunch. I don't really take that much of a lunch break. I eat lunch and then I do what I need to do. I'll check on the pro bono case. Um, it's not usually a daily thing that needs to be updated like we are doing discovery right now. So once I answer discovery, I'm waiting for them to answer discovery. Um, so it, it, it's just, you fit it into your schedule. As far as credit, I, I mean, I never really sought it for my firm either. So that might be on me. Um, but they know that I volunteer at this clinic and they're aware of it. I, I've never actually had the conflicts problem, but with construction companies, I don't think there probably would be one. Not really sure. Um, so I, I never actually thought about it until Steve said it. So I should probably pay a little bit more attention to that. Um, but I know there is a billing code at our firm that we could use. I could potentially use for my pro bono time. I've just never done it because I don't think that my bosses would particularly care if I entered my time in their system. Um, it's my time ultimately. And as long as I'm billing on the, their client matters, that's all they really care about. Great. Well, we are out of time. Um, I know I say this on my behalf, but I'm quite sure that all the panelists feel the same. If you have other questions, things that we didn't get to, we were only here for an hour and I know that incorporating pro bono into the rest of your career is a lifetime thing. Um, I invite you, please send me an email, um, uh, give me a call. Um, I'm happy to talk about this more with you. Pro bono is partly my job. Um, and so I'm happy to, to talk to you in, in more detail about anything um, that we've either talked, to, uh, talked about today or haven't had a chance to get to today. Um, so thank you panelists so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Brent, for inviting all of us. Thank you, Pilly, um, for giving uh, such a great summer experience. I know this is your guys' last meeting. Um, so thank you so much for, for you know, making it to the full stretch. Um, and I hope you guys have a great rest, rest of your day. Brent, any closing words? No, that's perfect. Thank you, Absolutely. everyone, for such a fruitful discussion. So great. Thanks. take care, everyone. Keep in touch. Bye. Bye.